just in the interest of continuing on this morning, so we're keeping to time, I'll introduce our third, third, third speaker this morning is Adrian Stagg, and he's a learning technologist from the Australian Digital Futures Institute at the University of Southern Queensland. So sounds like a fascinating job, certainly much more interesting than mine. And this morning he's going to, <laughs> definitely, um, going to talk to us about uh, digital curation tools. So over to Adrian and what will be a fascinating presentation. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Adrian Stagg. I'm one of the two learning technologists with the Australian Digital Futures Institute, uh, which is in the University of Southern Queensland up in Toowoomba. Now, my role essentially is as part of a research centre to look at all of the range of affordances and evaluation and implementation of educational technology. So we get to do a lot of the really cool stuff like the, the, the EPUB uh, projects which we're getting up at the moment, things like iTunes U, open educational resources, uh, also looking at things like gamification in higher education and the like. So there's an awful lot of uh, projects which we look for funding for and uh, already I've met a few people this morning who I'm going to come and harass at lunchtime uh, with the prospect that we could maybe go looking for some money together. <laughs> okay, uh, that's what it always comes down to. Our associate director always says that's really nice but who's paying for it? Now, my uh, discussion this morning is on digital curation tools, which have started to become more and more, uh, well, they're getting more and more traction. They are certainly getting more and more media attention, uh, despite the fact that they have been with us for at least sort of three to four years or thereabouts. I'm going to cover a couple of them in more detail, but I thought to set the scene as to why um, anybody would actually be interested in these types of tools, we're going to go through a few things. Start off with what we know. And then we'll move uh, from there, from the comforts of what we know, we will move out then to what we don't know. So first of all, what we do know. Let's go. Okay. So we know that technology, obviously, one of the first things that we say um, up at Adfi is that obviously the technology is all fine and good. It's nice and shiny and gets everybody excited, but does it actually add any value? And that's really what it comes down to. And I love this quote by Daniel Borstein, which is, technology is so much fun but we can drown in our technology. The fog of information can drive out knowledge. The idea that there is just so much emphasis on the technology and also on the noise that is out there that we perhaps get a little bit lost in all of that in our search for meaning and also to try and bring value, especially for higher education. So what do we know from there? We know that obviously there is a very high noise to signal ratio. Yeah, I've thrown some pop culture references. We'll see who laughs. We'll see who doesn't. Okay, so obviously there's, there is, there's, there's a great disconnect between the amount of noise and the signal which our students are able to access. Also, the expectations of what they can access. They're used to just going into Google and typing in what they are looking for. Okay, and expecting that with one search, they will simply get it. Okay, excellent, excellent. Okay. I, I, I know a crowd when I put Star Wars stuff up and everyone looks at me blankly. Okay. The other thing as well is that as librarians, uh, especially in academic libraries, we all know how important it is to try and embed or infuse the ideas of information literacy throughout the curriculum. Um, most of the discussions that I had when I was the faculty librarian for business, and, and this was across the sector with lecturers from other universities, I presented a paper at one conference on uh, how we actually go about embedding information literacy activities into the business curriculum so that they don't actually take up any of your valuable teaching time, but we actually have the students developing these skills concurrently with discipline knowledge. Now, I finished all of this and then opened it up for discussion to the audience. The first question that I got from somebody was, so now you're asking me to put something else in my curriculum. Where am I going to get the time for that? Um, so we, we get this an awful lot of the time. Uh, how, how do we actually embed or infuse? I, I love this idea of infusing information literacy. And also, if uh, any of you saw the um, Chronicle for Higher Education yesterday, we, uh, there was a report which came out of the University of Illinois uh, with what they're terming free-range learners. Um, the idea that they have with their free-range learners is that um, after... Uh, running all of these focus groups, they're finding, unsurprisingly, that students are, of course, supplementing their course material. They're going well beyond all of this. They're preferring things like video. They're preferring audio. All the sorts of stuff that we heard about in the previous presentation. And when they were asked, 
what is the reason why you are supplementing it with this wonderful engaging multimedia content the number one reason that they gave to the researchers was an utter dissatisfaction with the course content so they were taking it upon themselves to go out and to learn the content in a way which was engaging and which met with their lifestyle choices. So these sorts of things are very, very interesting when you start to set the scene for digital curation tools. Okay, so moving on from there. The other thing that we need to bear in mind is that humans, by their very nature, have this urge to collect. Okay, um, In lots of discussions back at work with the, the research, it seems to be, and I'm going to make a blanket statement here, the, the urge to collect and to store and to organise seems to be very much a male thing because we, we, we were saying, my, my colleague, for example, was pointing out the other day that he'd managed to track down the very last CD for a band that he's followed for the last 20 years and now he has a full set. And this digital curation is, is very much a, a, a similar idea. Now, this, of course, being the new Library of Alexandria, but we found, obviously, that, uh, that from very, very early times, after the death of Alexander, when we have Ptolemy starting to, to drag in as much knowledge, as much content as he could from the old world, and interestingly, when he let things out on interlibrary loan or he, uh, or he actually uh, allowed people to borrow them, he would index the price of an interlibrary loan or an overdue library book against the cost of a Greek warship. Now, I think that the world would be a very different place today if we collected overdue fines and interlibrary loan fees in warships. But that's a discussion for another day. Okay? Then, of course, you know, many centuries later, we have the Irish monastic movement, uh, okay, places like Skellig Michael, where you've got people rescuing all of this knowledge and collecting it up and making sense of things and scribbling in the margins. And the scribbling in the margins is the bit that when it starts to get really, really interesting, when people start to annotate history. If you've done anything around Roman history, one of the reasons why we all love to read Tacitus is because he was a gossip. It, he would sit there and give you information about the fact that, well, today everybody met and we discussed matters of trade and politics. And on the way home, I talked to the butcher's wife and, and all of this stuff became part of the public record. So you also have this other angle in terms of preservation, but that's slightly outside of the scope of what I'll talk about today. Now, with the digital curation tools that I'm going to talk about, they aren't necessarily these monolithic entities which are going about these sorts of businesses. They are not libraries collecting in information, making sense, making narratives of them. They aren't religious orders doing all of this. We are talking about amateur, individual people with a passion and an enthusiasm for doing this. I liken it very much to um, everybody would know somebody who is dead keen on family history. And so they spend an awfully long time rummaging through all sorts of places. Uh, like my mother-in-law, I said she's the only person I know who will get greatly excited at the prospect of visiting a cemetery. Uh, but they do. They go out there and they gather all of this information and they make sense within their own context for their own audience. And they bring together disparate forms of information. So it may be photographs of a headstone. It may be part of the genealogical record. It may be a trip down to the John Oxley Library. Okay, all of these different things, they bring together and they make sense. And this is really what you're doing with digital curation. So, how does it work? Well, essentially, the definition that I would put is that it is a sustained, user-driven experience. So the user decides what they want to collect. They decide where it's coming from and they make the ultimate decision as to what goes in the collection. But it is sustained. There's something about the design of these which pulls people back in. Also, it is reliant on the purposeful articulation of the information and resources which support the interest. This doesn't just necessarily I need to set up a topic and then have the best information dumped in your lap. You actually have to put a lot of thought into where you're drawing information from and also what information you are going to include and exclude. Now, it's the deliberate selection, as I just said before, and it can also be shared with others. Now, with most of these tools that I'll show you this morning, there is a social element to them. So you can tweet when you put something on there. You can link it to your Facebook account if you would like as well. Other users who have got similar interests to you can actually suggest content. And if you accept their suggestion, there's a little tiny reference at the bottom which says user 
their name, suggested this and it was accepted into the feed. So you can actually have groups of people starting to share information across and you can start to grab information from other people's um, areas of interest. Also, if you spot things in other people's curated collections, you can drag them into your own. Now, however, before we go in, we can look at them a lot in more detail. But as I always say, remember that when you're looking at brand new technology, everything can be shiny and very exciting and very engaging. But let's remember that even the most shiny, exciting and engaging technology has its limitations. Okay, so keep those limitations in mind. Now, the first one that we'll take a look at is going to be um, Storify. Now, Storify was originally started off in mid-2010 uh, as a way for journalists to make sense out of the huge volumes of information which would come out of news stories and allow them to construct their own narratives around certain world events. So, in here now, what has obviously happened is that the general populace has gotten this idea and thought, wow, this is a really cool tool, and have gotten in here. So you sign up for a free account, and what you can start to do then is to draw in elements from social media. So when you look at a lot of the stories, they might have, for example, a Facebook post, which might trigger a particular thought with you. What you can then do is go out onto the web, and you might draw things in from newspapers, you might find a blog that you quite like the look of, and so you grab that blog post and put it in here. There might be a video from YouTube, so let's put that in there as well. And then because this has already started to be constructed in real time, and other people are looking at it, and you might have assigned some hashtags to it, some people start to tweet about what you've put out there. And so let's capture those tweets as well, and we'll put them in as part of the description too. So what we now find is that an individual with a single interest in a particular news story, and it can be absolutely anything. You've got, at one end, we have, for example, one of the users on here is the British monarchy. So um, over the weekend, obviously, there was an awful lot of news stories which they had constructed about Her Majesty's Jubilee and the concerts, and, and it was interesting to see where they were pulling things from. They were pulling things from Her Majesty's Twitter account, which I'm sure is her. Um, I'm sure that she doesn't have somebody else. Um, although you can probably tell the ones that Will wrote. Uh, now, <laughs> now, in there as well, okay, so they've done to bring in things here to engage with people. And you can see they've got a number of subscribers in there. All the way through to one which I found the other day, really nice human interest story about a dog which had been caught in a drain pipe. And there were some beautiful photos in there that had been taken by people on the scene. But somebody had actually kicked it off by tweeting that they were actually waiting for the emergency services to come and get their dog and that they could see it and they were really worried. And so you had these, this group of people who all followed that individual who were starting to offer their emotional support around all of this. And then somebody else put something on Facebook, we then end up with some photos around all of this, and you actually found that there were people who subscribed to the story then and watched it evolve over the course of the day in real time until you know, several hours later, we finally get a photo of the fireman with the dog in hand and then the wonderful reunion of dog and owner. Okay, so again, this adds this human element. And this is what I'm very interested in in terms of preserving social record and preserving history, is that when we came back, back to that idea of the Library of Alexandria, of places like the Irish monasteries, where they'll bring in those volumes of information, yet we, we get a lot about the, the, uh, the, the time, we get a lot about the historical record, but that human face. For example, the one contrast that I would have in the diary of Samuel Pepys, we get his account where he is stood in his house watching the fire of London out of his window and he's writing about it. And that, to me, is a suddenly a rich human experience that you get. Social media and things like Storify here are very, very similar, in my mind, to that sort of rich human experience and that narrative that you get around events. Now, it would be very, very interesting to start to look a lot deeper into these sorts of things around key world events and see what people said. But, you know, 400 years later, we still have the diaries of Samuel Pepys. You can walk into any public library and you'd be able to get a hold of them. However, in 400 years' time, are we going to have access to things like this? Now, the people who are creating this, obviously, are looking at this being a very ephemeral 
transitory sort of experience, okay? Which is what most of us are looking for on the web anyway, is something that, that speaks to the immediacy of experience. Um, and that's one of the great strengths of this. So imagine, for example, if you had a group of journalism students who you could say, well, start to build a portfolio around stories that actually matter to you. Come up with some assessment criteria around all of that. And the beauty with this is, is that if you decide to make it public, other people are seeing it, other people are commenting. I was talking to somebody at the University of Wollongong a couple of years ago who was uh, experimenting with blogging in journalism. And he found that with his students, those who were graduating with blogs which were relevant and which were being followed were actually finding that that was something that they could take to future employers. They could go in and they would say, well, what, what have you done previously? Well, I haven't actually worked in this field before. However, I have a blog and I have 6,000 people who subscribe to it. I have this many hits to my blog each day. You can see that I put in the dedication updated every single day. And suddenly, these were employable attributes. Okay? And I would also very strongly argue that they are the sorts of activities which, as librarians, as academic librarians, we would want students engaging in. Digitally literate, information literate graduates. All of us probably have those two terms in our graduate attribute policies that we have at all of our universities. And these are engaging ways to start to build those skills. Now the other one is, uh, is Scoopit. Um, and Scoopit uh, allows you, it, it's really nice in the fact that it evolved out of social bookmarking. Hands up if you use Digo or Delicious. Okay, excellent. Um, now, those are great tools, but the thing that I always struggle with with them is one, finding anything in them, um, because everyone uses different tags, obviously. But the other thing as well is that it's very text-based. So obviously what we get is just lists that look very much like a list of references, really. This actually presents it more in a magazine-style format. And when you set up your Scoop It account, you decide what you are going to scoop information about. So in this case, this is actually um, run here uh, as it's a Scoop It page about Scoop It, um, obviously. And what you can do here is when you sign up, you put in the parameters for what you want to call your collection. You can put in a little quote or a general description about what the aims, objectives, or even a bit about the content. And then what you then do is assign keywords so that other people can find your Scoop It page. And from there, you have to assign where it is drawing the information from. It will automatically start to draw information from Google, Google Blogs, uh, Wikipedia. There's a range of different built-in. But you can actually choose to ignore those. So you, um, you can cancel those off your list. And any site which offers you an RSS feed, you can drag that RSS feed and dump it in as an additional source. Every single morning, you get an email which says that all of your new sources are ready for your selection. So you then click on the link, you get taken into your, your holding page, and it will give you a list of all the new content. And you can say whether or not you wish to scoop it or delete it, and you can go through. So again, you're having those critical reasoning skills to say, yes, I'll take this. You might not be able to articulate why, and it may be as simple as, I really like the look of it, uh, or it could be a much deeper reason as to why you want to collect that piece of content. And what you can do then is to start to build these collections. And what faces the public is all of the content that you have chosen to display under your topic. Now, all of us are very much familiar with the, uh, the piece of assessment, which can be run across almost any discipline, the annotated bibliography. We've all seen it in a number of different formats over the years, uh, where you have to pick a topic, you have to select some resources and build it up. This, I would argue, is a much more engaging way of doing that. And the other thing that you can start doing with this is that if you like it, you can start to re-scoop items into your own collection. So you can browse around for other people. You can follow other people's collections as well. So if you suddenly discover that there's a whole heap of other people who are interested in the same stuff as you, just start following them. And then each morning, just check what they're scooping and you can grab some of their stuff too. Now, it should be worth noting that with this, it is not actually duplicating the content. It is providing a link out. So if at any time, if that web resource was to fail, be taken down, any number of reasons why it's no longer connected, you'll actually not have it anymore in your collection. So, but I find that that's quite rare. 
I know a number of people have been using this for about six, seven months now, and all of their stuff is still there. Uh, because I think that there is a very much the idea that people who create web pages or create web material generally aren't in the habit of pulling it down. Um, so in this way, you can also share this through social media. So if you find something particularly useful or something that you think that other people would like to see, then you immediately start to share it out. And other people can start following you. In fact, built into this, you can't see it at the top of the screen, but right up at the top of the screen, it actually gives you a, a list of the number of people who have ever looked at your site and also the number of people who are following you. So in built into that is that idea of, well, how much impact am I actually having? And if you suddenly realize that you've got 30, 40, 50 people to start off with, maybe a couple of hundred or thousand people who are following your site, then you, um, then you suddenly realize that, um, that it is having that impact that you were, you were looking for. Now, the last one is Pinterest. Um, now, Pinterest is uh, designed purely for collecting um, things like photographs or images of any description. Now, it started to come into... Um, mainstream media, it got a bit of attention a few months ago, and much to my eternal disgust, um, the, the word Pinteresting is starting to make the rounds. Yes, yes. Um, so uh, you can see that already, uh, I, I think that the success of a web tool is whether or not it's turned into an adjective or a verb. Uh, and this here is another example. I don't spend an awful lot of time with this, mostly because I don't have a lot of interests that lie in visual arts and, and those sorts of areas. But again, you could build an online portfolio. So I think that what I've hopefully done this morning is just given you some ideas around how these sorts of tools could possibly be used. Um, I'm certainly willing to engage in some more discussion later on this afternoon. And also, if there, you think that there's a possibility of some projects that could come out of this, this is my plug, um, okay, certainly feel free to, to contact me at some stage. And as I said in, at the beginning, we'll go looking for some money together. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention this morning, everybody, um, and I hope to talk to you all later on. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Adrian, for that very presentation. And I'm sure there's probably one or two people here who would like to get some money with you as well. Excellent. <laughs> so, but as a thank you... Oh. Something I can share with my IT department. <laughs> there you go. Thank you very much.